The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Stoa. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. And uh, okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. The Stoa is a place for us to cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the nice edge of this very moment. And today uh, we have Peter Wang returning for his Sensemaker in Residence series at the Stoa on mental models. Um, and each week Peter comes in, discusses like a kind of a constellation of mental models that he personally uses. Last week was on relationships, and this is gonna be kind of a continuation on this subject with uh, sprinkling in some metaphysical talk. So um, that being said, how today uh, works, if you have any questions at any time when Peter is presenting his thoughts, because Peter will present his thoughts at first, just type in the chat. Uh, I'll call on you to unmute yourself. If you want me to read on your behalf, because this will go on YouTube, just indicate that somewhere. Um, and we'll be here for an hour, but we might go over a little bit if time uh, allows it. So that being said, I will allow Peter to unmute himself and take you in. Good morning, my friend. Good morning. And welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining me this morning. Um, let me go ahead and start the screen share. Uh, share screen. Oh, actually, you have to enable screen sharing for me. All right. Um, screen share. And it is, where to go? There it is. Great. All right. So um, those of you who were here last time, uh, I talked about relationships. And um, in the first, um, on the first uh, session we did, I talked about the metaphysics of quality. And I'm hoping to bring these things kind of um, together. You know, every week I talk about something, I try to relate it back to um, what was talked about the week before. Uh, let me see if I can move this over so I can see myself a little better. Great. So today I'm gonna to be talking about relationships, uh, a little bit about networks uh, still, relationships and networks like from last time, but really talking about change and hopefully have maybe a little more time for, for dialogue. Last time I went fairly long talking about a lot of stuff, but um, I have a slightly shorter slide deck this time. So uh, I'll look at networks and intelligence building on last time. Um, I'll look at what, what's called process metaphysics and just spend a little time talking about that. Uh, and then build, building on that relational process metaphysics and then network relational process metaphysics. So a lot of the word metaphysics uh, in there, please don't be alarmed by that. Um, hopefully it'll be more, um, more accessible than, than this slide may initially make it look. So again, last time I, I talked about, you know, thinking about different ways of looking at relationships, just to recap, uh, we generally in the vernacular think about relationships as the, the connecting thing, the thing between two selves or two bodies or two objects. We can say the sun and the moon are, or the sun and the earth are a relationship. We can say that um, all of us here uh, on this call, on, in this session, are in relationship to each other. But it's always viewed in sort of this node link format where you have nodes and they're connected by links. Um, but the alternative view to look at that is if we make the links themselves the first class thing, and the nodes are actually not so much concrete structures or atoms, but the links and the interactions are the important things, the binding energy, if you will. And when those come together and cohere in a place or in a region, abstract or concrete, um, that's what creates then a thing. So things, substances, objects, they are, they are maybe secondary and somewhat uh, a lot of the things are actually created by the relationships from the outside world. And I also talked about the sense of um, the sense of self and the sense of agency, freedom, what have you, that sense of self and sovereignty emerges when we have um, an inner sort of society of relationships pushing against an outer society of relational pressures. Um, and so this is, this is a way to think of the world from a relational metaphysics, if you will, um, as opposed to an atomic node, nodes with links kind of metaphysics. Now, um, I wanted I wanted you to, to this interesting little story I saw um, come across <laughs> on Reddit, which was this little cat that was riding the public buses, um, and and he would uh, take like round trips, and and the driver would get him food. He would sit on passengers' laps, 
uh, and the driver would let him off at his stop. And so, I, so the thought experiment, besides this being a very heartwarming and adorable little story, the thought experiment is, what is it like to be this cat? Remember, you're a cat. You don't know how buses work. They're just really, really big cats that squish other cats, right? You don't know what people are. They're two-legged giant things. As far as you know, there's cats. They're just inedible. And then, and they're not mice and they're not, you know, bugs. I mean, they're, they're not grass. They're, but you don't really have a model of like anything in your world. If just try to reduce yourself down to a cat brain. You're this cat and you step onto a bus. The driver feeds you. I mean, you don't know that as a driver that he has anything to do with where the bus goes. You just go on this bus, you get fed, you sit on people's laps, you get petted. No one eats you, no one beats you. And then um, at some point you feel like there's some attention on you and you, and the doors open and you get off and it's right where you need to be. Um, really, I would encourage you to really try this. I mean, all of us, we know we're conscious and we think about human consciousness all the time, I'm sure. But try to think about what it's like to be a cat <laughs> in this complex world of buses and um, uh, you know, metropolitan transport. And you're walking on this bus like a boss and you're getting off this bu bus like a boss. Uh, this is the reason I, I, I prompt this is because there is a, an intrinsic amount of trust that exists between this cat and this organism of the bus, right? It gets eaten. It feels like it's getting eaten by a bus and then it gets regurgitated by a bus. And there are other you know, agents inside the bus that are relatively harmless. My takeaway on this is that trust is the generative kernel that allows for relationships to arise and, and, um, and abundant relationships of that, not dependent relationships so much. But, but in this case, it's more of a, I guess it's somewhat of a, of a dependent relationship. But at some point, the cat must have crossed a bridge of trust, like in Indiana Jones, right? Um, and he walks across that invisible bridge. Spoiler alert, by the way. But, um, <laughs> you know, there is there is this kernel of trust that begins the possibility of a relationship. And if it doesn't get violated, if it gets validated, reciprocated, then a relationship can arise. And, and I, uh, I think sort of just kind of taking a swag at this, I think that this is true of essentially all really solid relationships is that there must be a kernel or a series of kernels or a continuation of trust that exists. And trust is open and vulnerable. This cat, it could go into a bus and who knows, as soon as that door closes, 10 pit bulls to come rushing out the back. I mean, I have a pit bull and they're not actually that violent, but you know, the point is that that cat is getting eaten by a bus. It's trusting that it's not going to die, right? It trusts. And every time the driver lets it off at its stop, it, it, it validates, right? There's a validation there. And, and I'm not going to talk about the other question, which is a deeper question of what is it like to be this driver? Why does that human being driver do this to the cat? That's a completely different question, but at least what it's like to be the cat. Um, the other thing is that this, of course, works across species. We can think about it in the concept of human relationships, but clearly with our pets, with the animals that we love and take care of, th this is a thing, right? It also, it doesn't have to be animals. We tend to gardens. Now, the gardens can't really reciprocate much to us because they move at a different, they have a different meta metabolic pace than we do. So do forests and so do the rivers and so does all of the earth. But there is still, um, I mean, when we go to, when we go to taking care of things that have longer time span and deeper, more complex dynamics than ourselves, now we're the cat, right? So this is the thing to think about. We're all cats on buses to some extent. We don't know if we're gonna get eaten and whenever that door opens and we're back magically at the doorstep of our home, we feel blessed, we feel validated, right? The trust, the trustful connection worked. So the other thing is that when we think about the world purely from a transactional perspective and from an atomized interaction perspective of transactions, trust is always the residual, the residue, the remainder that's just chopped off and forgotten about. It is the externality in the social binding that's completely ignored. And this is the issue I have when I meet people who are, um, and I do have friends who are like hardcore objectivists and hardcore like just individuals, atomized, sovereign, interacting with other individuals. We have no need to trust, it's trustless. We have this wonderful crypto blockchain thing, totally trustless, and we can facilitate all these interactions. And it's like, actually trustless isn't the point. The point is to facilitate trust. That's where actually the generative value happens. And so even in business, and I'm, I'm a business person myself, right? I'm a CEO and I'm a founder and entrepreneur. And in business, my, my experience has been that 
the the I the con the word transactional is a dirty word, right? When I'm talking to somebody, if I'm talking to one of my uh, executives and we're vetting a candidate, and and she says to me, well, yeah, you know, their experience, but they're kind of transactional. That's a bad word. That that candidate's not going to get hired, right? So the idea in business that it's all transactions is actually looking at it from the wrong lens. In business, business the way I always talk about it, business is transactions in the context of a relationship. That's the big difference in business. And like when, that's why you don't do business with friends, so to speak. Because friends, we don't have a ledger of our transactions. If we're going to transact, let's say we all go in on a ski trip somewhere or something. Well, we have a ledger. We know exactly the domain and the scope of activity that we're going to have a transactional accounting. But everything else, we don't, we don't address on that. And if, if, you, if you look at friends who have drama, I'm sure you all have friends that have drama that happens, look at it through this lens. And I think what you'll see is that oftentimes the, the cause of drama is when people have differing expectations about transaction, who's keeping a ledger, right? What was relational? What was give and take? And, if, and you can't live in a world, humans cannot form a socialization without some give and take, right? So this is, again, starting with the cat, going to relational and really thinking about um, the way we build networks and socializations that are generative is when we can trust with each other in that relationship, or we can use trust to build these generative connections. And they are not transactional. Other transactions can be conducted through them, can flow through them and be facilitated by them. They certainly can scale transactions. Another great example of this is in banking in the, um, uh, in the Middle East, there is essentially a trust-based peer-to-peer financial settlement and credit system that they have. That is not like the sort of global, you know, like, um, you know, the way when you swipe a credit card in a foreign country, there's a global series of banks and settlement and everything talks over high speed internet. That's the way that we do it kind of in the, in the, in the Western world with credit cards. But if in the Middle East, um, there's, there's essentially a highly federated and decentralized um, credit facility across countries and cities. And um, it all works on a basis of trust between all these different people. It's a novation network. The, the word novation is not used very much in the vernacular. It's kind of a term of art, but it is, uh, it is the correct term here. They proxy trust, they delegate trust up to this peer social network of lender clear prime brokers. So um, anyway, so completely switching gears. Um, ship of Theseus. How many people here are familiar with the paradox of the ship of Theseus? A few people. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll walk through it for those who are not familiar. It's a paradox that says, uh, this actually comes from the Greek because you know uh, there was a, um, uh, a, st a story there from, from Plutarch basically that, that said that basically um, they have a ship and every time some of the wood got rotted or decayed or got damaged, they would replace that piece of wood and they put new stronger timbers in its place, right? And so, the, and so over time, essentially every single piece of wood on the ship had been replaced. And the question is, is it the same ship, right? Is it the same ship? And of course, because philosophers have too much to eat and too much time, they argue back and forth internally about this paradox. Um, and, uh, and it's a fun one. It's a fun one to try with kids. It's a fun one to try just in, you know, if you're uh, at a cocktail party, um, it's a great way to plumb the depth of thinking of various people around you because it does strike us as quite a paradox. I mean, we as people, um, our atoms are being replaced all the time, right? We're decaying, we're sloughing off cells, sloughing off atoms, we're boiling off. If you, if you leave an ice cube on the counter, it melts into water and that water eventually evaporates. We are just bags of water. We're constantly evaporating. I'm, I'm drinking right now to rehydrate. New atoms. Is this Peter? Well, no, this is, a, this is some jar of guava nectar, right? But check this out. Now that just became Peter, body of Christ, right? This kind of thing is so accessible and so much fun, you play with it. And it all is centered on a metaphysical flaw. And a metaphysical flaw is this. We in the normal, let's say the normies out there, the muggles see a world of static objects or a static world of objects. Some are little blobbies, some are collections of blobbies. Here's a grocery bag filled with a bunch of things. Each of those things is themselves atomic. Maybe they're not atomic, but we can talk about the liquid conceptually as a thing. We have a static world of objects. But kind of with the relational thinking from last time, and I talked about relationships between people, but you can take it down to the metaphysical level, right? If we see the entire world as um, 
composed of overlapping superpositions of relationships. Then, and it's a real like mind bender to think about things this way. But if we think about it in this, in this way, then the ship of Theseus problem disappears. And I'll give you a concrete example of, of, of this kind of thing, which I always love. Um, holograms. Now, most of you have probably seen a hologram. If you have like a, a Visa credit card, you see a little hologram printed, or you've gotten, you know, maybe stickers, uh, maybe even a science museum, and you looked. And the, the thing about a hologram that's different than a photograph, of course, is if I take a photograph that captures one perspective, if I turn the photograph sideways, I mean, I don't see a different perspective of the thing inside the photograph. Now, with our tablets nowadays and our smartphones, we get augmented reality things that are really cool, right? I can sort of turn the thing around. It actually changes the perspective of the camera in the virtual space. But, um, but, but of course, static pictures don't do that. I take a picture, I print it out. I look at the picture at different angles. It's the same point of view in the picture itself. Holograms are not this way. Holograms, when you bounce light on them, they project a light field such that if you move your head around that light field, you actually see different perspectives. So what's shown here on the left is this is the hologram of a mouse. And when you look from different directions at the projection of the hologram, you see different views on the mouse as if there was a real virtual mouse back there. Now, if you, I don't know how many of you have, have then actually gone and looked at what a hologram actually looks like, you know, because they bounce laser light off of the hologram itself and it produces this light field you look at. The actual hologram looks like just a bunch of overlapping, like, it, it doesn't look like anything. I mean, you look at it and you're like, what is that? It's a bunch of like, it almost looks like noise. But what it is, is extremely, extremely tiny um, imprints of the light field itself, the diffraction of the light field. It captures it. And then when you, when you shine a coherent light on that light field again, it reconstitutes. So it's like taking a slice of the light field and without getting into the physics of optics and all these other things, um, Suffice to say that uh, when you do come across the word holographic uh, in, in, in maybe um, in technical literature when they, or in philosophy, the idea of a hologram is that we're capturing multiple points of view and something about like the three-dimensional aspect of the stuff, of the light field, we're capturing that and projecting it in this, this little miniature thing. That the idea of the smaller thing captures a lot of the structure and detail and multiple perspectiveness of, of this larger reality. Hol holography, right? Hologram. Um, and so likewise here, uh, I, drew, I started drawing this thing. I bring up the holograms because it's, it reminded me a lot of what an actual hologram looks like. It's like diffraction rings all like tied into each other. So if we look at the world, not as a static world of objects, but as these overlapping worlds of relations, um, then you, you can, uh, the, the way I talk about it is that when, when, we, when we think about um, the world is not consisting of, of, of atomic um, substance, but we see everything as a continuum in energy and space, right? Uh, if you really go, and I mentioned this last time, in quantum mechanics, if you go to the um, quantum mechanical fundamentals of atoms, they're not really a solid atom thing. It's, it's quantum mechanical wave functions that because of measurement, because of interaction, because of whatever else, they, they form a spatially localized region. But otherwise, you model it uh, in, 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 um, as a continuum field. If you think about the world as continuum field like this, then, um, then you realize that that things are not bounded. So if you, if you look at the world as atoms, you tend to think of them as being bounded in space. But here's the other thing, you tend to think of them as static and bounded in time. When you think about the world as these waves, you intuitively don't think of a wave as frozen. It's weird to think of a wave, like if you drop a rock in, in a pond and the waves are rippling, and to imagine the waves as being stopped seems super unnatural. It is natural for us to think of wave phenomenon as being evolving. Waves themselves are just wave fronts that are evolving, if you will, right? So when we go to a wave or a continuum, a medium view of the, a medium based way, way of looking at the world, it leads us naturally to what's called process metaphysics or process philosophy. And, um, and the idea here is that it is a different point of view than say the Aristotelian view of the world, which says the world consists of objects, objects of fundamental substances, 
we now know that there's you know 118 or whatever it is fundamental types of atoms that we found um and atoms are consisting of these fundamental particles and it's like all of this stuff but it's all a world of static construction process philosophy turns this completely around and says actually everything is changing all the time there's actually nothing that is just is everything is changing all the time um and our only ability to perceive static objects is because we insist on tracing causal narratives through the world. So we say, well, here's a thing. And when this thing has this dynamicness to it, it knocks on this thing and that thing does these things. And my need and my um, intentional trace of causality through all these overlapping wave fronts of energy and possibility, that need for that narrative is actually what creates metaphysical reality, right? And, and, and this is, again, just super, this is a, a younger me listening to myself pontificating like this would say, hold up, Peter, if I were to throw a brick at your face, there's no process philosophy involved. There's some hard substance there in that brick, right? Come on, stop. What, what crack are you smoking? And, and it's true that a brick falling on my toe or hitting my face would hurt. And there is substance there. Um, uh, but, you know, pain, as the Buddhists say, pain is just attachment, right? Um, if I'm not attached to my face having to be <laughs> a, a, a piece like this, no, actually, that's a joke. Um, the, the, the point is that the, if you really get into the details of what happens at the physical level in the physics, you see that there's a lot of truth to this, even in the mathematical formulations. When you zoom out and you look at the dynamics of human civilization, there's also a lot of truth to this. All of us, how many of you have used the word France in conversation? Probably all of you at some point in your life have used the word France. But there is no France, is there? Right? Which France are you talking about historically through time? If you talk about France right now, the border of France, and I'll get to the boundary in just a second, but you're not just talking about the space within France, you're also probably referring to French culture, which is a timeless thing, emerging from all the French people, French people living in France and all the expats. You have all of these different things that have a Franceness to them. Now, none of us, I think, would deny that France exists. And yet, as soon as you ask that question, you're like, well, but what does it mean for it to exist? It's not a brick, right? Um, and as soon as we start creating these hard boundaries in our metaphysics, like, well, a brick is real, but France isn't. Uh, you know, an atom is real, but, you know, I don't know, you know, Christianity isn't. When you start approaching the world with this metaphysical frame, you end up with all sorts of faux paradoxes, like the ship of Theseus, that only exists because your frame is broken, not because the world um, has any weirdness to it, right? Everyone, is, everyone in France knows what France means, and everyone lives in France as if they live in France, not as if they're all just delusional about living in France. So the idea of going to alternative metaphysics like this is to create a greater synthesis of phenomenon and relational things. So. Um, and even an atom, just to make, just to kind of do a little more like science hour here. Um, I don't know how many of you know this, but uh, we, we've all learned in school, there's the proton and the neutron and they're in the nucleus of the atom. And there's a bunch of electrons, you know, either you might have drawn the picture of the orbitals, but really they're kind of these clouds of electrons, right? Not a difficult concept. Certainly any physics, chemistry, engineering student at any university in the world would agree with this assessment of the atom. However, proton and neutron and electron. Well, they were discovered at different times and they have vastly different kinds of properties to them to the point where you almost question their metaphysical weight. Electrons, well, do they really exist? I don't know. It's like, because, because there's, a, there's a wave, there's a probability wave. We can't even talk about where this thing is until you hit it with something else. And then it becomes localized depending on what you're hitting it with. And it's like, what other thing in the world you know, France doesn't vary depending on which angle I come at France from, right? <laughs> like it doesn't, like there's other things that are actually like France is more real than electrons to some extent. And then you look at protons and neutrons. Well, protons, okay, the, the, the protons have mass and charge and they're quite heavy. This were all, you know, the, the most of the mass. Neutrons are also massive just like protons but they have no charge. They're intellectually neutral. Protons, how long does a proton last? Can a proton be destroyed or created? Well, in a super, in a, uh, in a, super collider, you can, you can destroy them and you know, knock them into each other and get little bits out of them. But in general, a proton will stay around for infinite number of like infinity ever, forever. Naturally, protons just kind of are always there. Neutrons, which are also the same mass as protons and are not electrically neutral, they have a half-life of 10 minutes. Did anyone ever tell you that in high, in high school? Neutrons decay naturally in the space of not even a television sitcom episode. 
So here's something that lasts for the life of time of the universe. Here's something that decays instantly. And here's something else that floats around in a bubble of probabilities until we probe it with another bubble of probabilities. And that is the building blocks of matter. So when we talk about metaphysics as being all like, oh, it's too hand wavy. And of course you can look at worlds in many different ways, but what does it mean? The actual fundamental metaphysics we use to kind of construct physical reality, when you get down to it, it's actually kind of effed up. It's kind of messed up. And it's not nearly as solid as you might think it is. So when we talk about process philosophy, again, to the point of the holographic view of the world or looking at the world as relationships, there's nothing wrong. I guess I'm just saying this almost as an apologia to say there's nothing wrong with taking alternative frameworks. It's like taking, you know, an axis and rotating it and looking at the world through a different axis. There's nothing wrong about it. There's nothing more fake about it. It's actually a really useful and more unifying way to look at the world as processes, as becoming, as, uh, as waves and as relationships colliding with each other. And furthermore, the static world of objects, that static metaphysics, static object metaphysics, it has nothing to say about memetics, about the dynamics of human socialization. This other one scales up and down and across all different kinds of domains. So one, uh, another, uh, just to really put a, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but uh, talk about the, you know, the measure of electrons and does France exist. This is a picture of the coastline of California. It's not on fire, but it is the coastline of California. And here's a really fun question. Again, another great cocktail sort of party, dinner, dinner table sort of like thing. How long is the coast of California? This is a question of physics. This is a question of reality, right? This is not Peter going off on weird metaphysics. This is a very, like we all kind of, well, to the extent that we acknowledge there exists a thing as California and we bound it, and we, to the, to the extent that we acknowledge that there's water and there's liquid and solid state and where in the, the sand, you know, constitutes the boundary, there is a length of coastline. Surely there exists a coastline of California that does exist, right? At some point you're in the ocean, at some point you're not. And surely it has a length. I can measure anything in the world. Why can't I measure the length of the coastline of California? But here's the, here's the other, this is, this is another fun ship of Theseus thing, right? The length of the coast of California depends on the scale at which you measure it. If I measure the coast of California with a yardstick, I get a different answer than if I measure it counting every millimeter of jaggy. If I zoom out to an aerial view and I'm measuring it by kilometers, I get a different measure. None of those answers are correct and yet none of them are wrong either. Right? What this is highlighting is that the very concept, um, it, it's, it's, you know, what's the issue here? I mean, I, how many of you have, have, I don't know how many of you have thought about this, but there is, there's actually not an issue here except for our metaphysics and our sort of philosophy of science, right? The California does not have a problem. Its coastline does not have a problem. The ocean is not confused about this. The sands are not confused. What's confused is that the concept of length is not a purely objective measure right? Length itself is actually a projection of subjectivity. How do we want to measure? How do we want to perceive it? That gives us a readout. That readout is contextualized by how we measured it. And as long as we carry that context forward, we can do a lot of interesting and useful things. If we lose that context and say, nope, there is this objective thing that is the length of California. There is objective truth here. It is the length of California. I don't, what, why are you talking about yardsticks and, and metaphysics? There is, of course, meta, uh, 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 California with a coast and it has a length. Done. If you take that kind of view of the world, you're just going to be confused by paradoxes left and right. Because again, to Whitehead's point here, causality, causal narratives, all of the ways that we look at objects in the world and their relationships to each other, if we view them as static and not as dynamic things that are becoming, if we view them as, as, as atomic things, substances that bounce against each other and not as overlapping waves of possibilities and of energies and, 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 and reality and dynamics, then we have paradoxes all over the place because, because it's our own measuring tools, our own mental models that create the paradox. Just like the measuring stick here creates the paradox. So to make this more visual, an atomic or spatial view really talks about beings. In fact, we use that term beings. It's a being, it's an object, it's a thing. But a process view views everything as a snapshot of becoming. All beings are snapshots of becoming and everything is constantly becoming. 
So physics, any of you who learn physics, you learn about objects, you learn about their motions, you learn about energy and dynamics. In fact, we call it kinematics, which is the motion of objects, and dynamics, the study of energies that lead those objects and systems to evolve in time to the way they do. And, uh, uh, and that's, I mean, that's what physicists do. That, those are the actual terms we use. So in physics, we're based on, uh, uh, mo you know, physics in the modern era is based on a metaphysics of static things that do have dynamicness to them, but the dynamicness is always about certain capturable properties of the static thing. The process view is a different metaphysics, and it is actually more resonant with like the quantum mechanical view of the world, and maybe future physics to come will be based on process metaphysics, so that we can always talk about uh, things, uh, these four-dimensional flows. In fact, there's a term for this called four-dimensionalism, and this whole body of thought, which is that we, we should stop looking at things as static things that evolve in time, and actually look at everything as processes that interact and create coherent zones in space and in time. Um, and this, this framing of being or becoming um, is, um, is a term used by, uh, you know, I stole it from Ilya Prigozhin's, uh, the title of his book. Um, he is a Nobel Prize winner, very, very, um, very, very smart person. Um, and when you look at complexity and chaos, when you look at dynamical systems, when you see physicists that study things like, um, you know, uh, uh, laminar flows and nonlinearity or spin glasses, metastable things. Um, people who study that kind of stuff, they're right, they're, they're basically probing through the holes of the current metaphysics, the Aristotelian metaphysics. And they're always having to look at things from kind of this process and dynamical view. So all that being said, if we then layer in the stuff that I was talking about the first, um, in the very first session about the metaphysics of quality, where we view individuals as having a physical and biological and social and intellectual aspect. If you don't view, if you don't look at that layer cake as a static layer cake, but as overlapping flows, I mean, each one existing on top of the other. I mean, they're not actually disjoint like this. I drew them this way, but, but recognize this sort of like one is higher frequencies on top of lower frequencies on top of even lower frequencies, but it's all one body of water. It's all you, you're a bag of water, right? So if you add the metaphysics of quality to this kind of process metaphysics view, you realize, oh, oh shit, I'm actually multiple different kinds of overlapping dynamics evolving in time. Um, and each part of the self has a different rate of evolution. Each part of the self as it evolves in time interfaces with the other parts and, and, and maybe resonates with it or jostles against it. Um, which is, you know, I the, one of the terms I love from Stoic practice about the integral self, right? Mindfulness and the wholeness of being the embodied self is, is essentially another way of saying, make sure your intellectual part is in resonance with your social part, is in resonance with your biological and physical, all of it moves together. You gotta have good diet, good exercise, good rest, uh, learn how to, how to trust and love authentically, right? And then um, harness your attention, be mindful of your attention. All these things is making sure that one part of these waves don't get, don't start bubbling so fast it evaporates and you lose mass and you lose coherence with the rest of the you because all of you is becoming in time. So here's the other thing. Uh, I, I lightly touched on this before when I said that uh, in a process metaphysics, we view everything as flows of constant becoming and static objects or any kind of static approach towards, if we approach something at, uh, from, from a static perspective, we're bounding it in time and space, okay? But we, we, we can form relationships with each other. I mean, you are not me. And even if we hold hands and touch, even if we're in an embrace, we're still two distinct objects, right? I mean, at a, at a, at a very visceral and a very accessible intuitive level, it seems to be the case. But when we look at, so, so there's a relationship still somewhat between two distinct objects. But if we think about the self as not just localized in space, but localized in time, then we can talk about our relationship to our future and our relationship to our past. And we, we do this anyway. I mean, you don't have to go through metaphysics to understand that people talk about their past and their futures, right? That's something we do. But if you think about it this way and you decompose or deconstruct a little bit and look at the different frequencies of being and frequencies uh, and rates of change of, your, of the different layers of yourself, you can see that you relate to the different aspects of yourself in different ways. So in the past, we have memory. We have the memory of ourselves. We have even subconscious memory and subconscious trauma, right? You get to kind of the Freudian stuff. Um, and 
uh, and then we also have a future potential. And we interface not just with our own past selves and futures, but with each other's and with different aspects of each other's. If I'm only interested in someone's biological future, that's like literally what we mean when we say something is objectifying and it's ugly, right? No, 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 one, no one wants to get objectified. And what does objectified mean? It means that you're getting reduced from this complex of, this, uh, of multiple overlapping evolu evolving becomings into a single aspect. You, you, get, you get bottled into a single aspect, you're objectified and then probably transacted with as an object. So when we um, talk about interacting with our past selves and our future selves, these are all different lanes or different um, aspects we can be relating to ourselves in. Um, a lot of coaching, a lot of therapeutic and therapy sort of work is in helping people get a current set of things in resonance with each other. You know, if they're, if they're, if they're broken, if they're hurt, uh, broken is a, sorry, kind of a derogatory term, but um, if people are feeling a lot of pain and carrying a lot of trauma, then parts of them are stuck. Other parts are trying to get forward and none of it's in resonance. If you can get in resonance by showing that they can actually break with the past a little bit, or they can understand the past in context, that they're not stuck in the past, they don't have to carry it forward every moment. That's a very um, standard practice in, in, um, uh, in therapy and in coaching, right? So this idea of seeing yourself as a multi-layered thing evolving in time, relating to yourself in this way and relating to others in this way, then leads to the topic of love. And I think my, my, my sort of working definition uh, of love is when we are taking a vested interest, we are actively putting energy into helping some other entity or collection of process flows reach their future full integral potential. And we put energy into that. We trust that that energy will, well, I mean, we don't even need to trust in the recipro uh, reciprocity of it, but we're putting it into it, not because of a, re a reflection we get out of it or something we transact out of it, but because uh, we're just putting energy into this other system. So as we're taking our energy and our essence and putting it into some other system, uh, donating, contributing, helping the other system achieve resonance and, and um, maximal optionality uh, as it evolves forward in time. Um, and then a mutual loving relationship is, of course, when two people or objects or whatever zones of confluences of, 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 of processes, when they do that for each other. So anyway, that is process metaphysics. That's a bunch of a whole bunch of metaphysics, probably more than you care for on a Friday morning. Um, and now I will stop for questions. All right. Uh, so start dropping your questions in the chat. Have a, have a cue in front of them if you want to uh, speak it. And also, if you want, just want to share a statement with Peter or the group, just maybe put an S too, and then we can, we can go uh, do that. Someone did say, I'll read this, uh, okay. Peter Wang is lovable. <laughs> Thank you. We're all lovable. We're all lovable, but I appreciate, I appreciate you. Thank you very much. So uh, I'll start with the first question. Um, you mentioned something about normies, right? And uh, <laughs> you know, like normies got they're a norm. They're, they're lovable too. They're lovable too. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, normies got a norm and then the norm yeah. right there is, you know, to contrast process philosophy, like a static philosophy. And there's sort of like an epistemic or, or I should say metaphysical violence, like mm -hmm. subtly when you interact with someone who is like projecting a static philosophy on you. So I'm wondering if you have any tactical mental models in order to ground yourself in a process philosophy and encourage it in others. Um, and I was returning to what you said about trust and mm -hmm. love. Um, like there's something that I'm, I'm, I'm terming as the Hemingway heuristic, like Ernest okay. Hemingway said, if you want to find out if someone's trustworthy, trust them. Um, right. And it, it relates to the Pygmalion, I think, effect where if you just kind of uh, view someone in a certain light, it influences them to become that way. Mm -hmm. So, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that and if you have any tactical mental models in order to kind of like, you know, deal with that. that, that yes. Attention. So let me walk backwards. Right. So the last thing you said was the, 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 the Pygmalion um, thing. Uh, so interesting, right? Cause this is related to the, uh, when I talked about celebrity culture um, and the, the fact that our uh, current media systems or, or communication technologies created the concept of celebrity and, and even the, um, the, uh, the song uh, video killed the radio star right? By adding a video aspect to media, uh, we removed the primality and the primacy of sound and made it all about image and aesthetic. 
So um, we it, it, people do deeply understand, or they've perceived some of these phenomena. They don't understand it, but they've perceived some of these things. Um, so, but that thing about um, the Pygmalion thing, um, let me see the right way to talk about this. Okay, so when you look at this picture here, um, back to the screen share here, right? Um, the uh, celebrity is, a, is very much, well, not even double-edged sword, celebrity is crushing right? Every celebrity has talked about, y'all don't understand what it's like to be famous. You can't walk down the street without people coming to you with an expectation of who you are. So that's Pygmalion times, you know, 10 million, right? With 10 million followers. They're all telling you, however, not that Eliza Doolittle, you could pass off as the, you know, whatever, some duchess or whatever of some, you know, Transylvanian thing. You are a gutter snipe, right? Hey, I saw you on the gutter snipe video. Why don't you a gutter snipe? Right, this is the Urkel. Like I think about the character that I play, Urkel, as the like he can never get away from being Urkel. So this is the same thing that that Pygmalion thing. How we look at things. Now here's the thing: if we don't ever interact with something, we just perceive it, and that's just our perception and our subjectivity. That doesn't matter. There's no impact on that thing or person or whatever at all. But if we all socialize with each other and we create in the social field an understanding of what that avatar is or that expectation is, now we're doing a thing to that person, right? Even if we actually do ourselves don't directly talk to that person. So there's kind of like social media has created this in just, you know, uh, all over the place. It's really terrible. Um, so the, uh, the YouTuber generation will figure this out at some point, but, but this is the doom that's coming to them. Um, but when it comes to tactically addressing people with, um, uh, who are stuck in a static metaphysics, you can, well, you can probe, I mean, depending on how long you have to interact with them, uh, if you're really sitting down for a long conversation, you can start with the ship of Theseus and just get them, uh, confuse them. Because confusion at least is honest, right? Um, what's true about a Trump voter that's solidly MAGA, solidly like just F you, I'm Trump, uh, is that they're not confused at all. They're not confused at all. They know for damn sure exactly uh, why he is great for America and why you hate America if you don't vote for him, right? So when you talk to people, if you can get them into that liminal moment with confusion, then that's great. So take these two tools, take the coast of California, um, ask them to measure the Calif coast of California, ask, ask them if the ship of Theseus is still the ship of Theseus. And, and if they say, well, that's just, that's just a bunch of philosophy nonsense, then I would say, try to, on your feet, adapt that to something that's more accessible to them. Because the great thing about well, what I think the correct metaphysics here is with process metaphysics, the great thing about it is that it's accessible. Everything in the world changes. Everything in the world has this character to it if you look at it across the right time scales and sample it with the right frequency. So um, the tree in the backyard, right? Um, everything you can look at and use the starting point to talk about process metaphysics. Um, and, and to get them the goal is to use these things, confuse them, and get them thinking about how things change, how they themselves process change. And isn't it the case that the world is always changing? Because most of the time when people use subject or static metaphysics as a defensive mechanism in particular, um, it's, it's to defend. It's to defend, a, um, it, it's, it's always to defend a worldview, defend a way of doing things. Um, it, it usually, there's a sense of conservatism and entrenchment I feel like, um, as opposed to a dynamic Zen Aikido master kind of like flowing with the things as they change. So anyway, I would encourage, I would encourage that. Does that actually answer your question? Are those, is that helpful? Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it reminds me of Venkat's uh, gray pilling uh, term, um, like the, the idea of giving people gray pills to get them in that liminal state. Mm -hmm. um, and someone in the chat says that could be, uh, you know, anxiety invoking. And uh, I wonder if there's a way you can do it in a, in a, more in a delightful way. way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the coast of California is relatively approachable because, uh, and if, you know, or something to that form. Think about uh, other kinds of things where our measurement reveals. And actually, you know what? Uh, the way to find something like this is look for complexity because humans naturally do not deal with complexity. We always overlay complexity with metaphysical or epistemic boundaries and wrap it up and say, well, here's the thing. Um, and um, so anytime you find or think of something as complex, not complicated, a watch is complicated, a cockroach is complex, right? Um, 
So look not for complications because those are decomposable into smaller bits that are all then static moving with, with very linear and, and rigid dynamism. But complex things, there's a sloshiness to them. It could be a flock of birds flying, a, a murmuration of birds, right? All, all kind of swooping around. Look for complexity and, and find something there that could amuse and delight them. You know, delight and confusion, they could go hand in hand. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so let's turn to the, the questions. Uh, Kyle, you had a question. Sorry, couldn't find my mute. Um, so I, it, it, uh, I was kind of riffing on this in the chat. I'm not sure if it makes sense, but you all can tell me if it does or doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, I've never made the connection before that kind of the process versus static mindset that you're talking about uh, fits into what Carol Dweck's done on fixed versus growth mindsets, kind mm -hmm. of from a psychological perspective. Mm -hmm. And and so I was, I was thinking about back to the cat um, that there's there has to be some individual level agency towards the choice of being in a trusting relationship. Yes. And, yes. and, and so that's the cat. That's obviously the cat, but mutual trust is at least dyadic if it's not more complicated than that. Right. Right. It is, and, it is, it is yeah, pebbles in a pond, all these overlapping waves, right? It, you could just drop two pebbles in, but we live in a world of at least seven and a half billion really interesting pebbles. Right. So um, yes. So the individual, I guess what I'm trying to get at is what are the necessary and sufficient conditions at the individual level for the choice to engage in trust? So, uh, okay, let me share my browser screen with you. Um, so I don't know how many people here on the call are familiar with um, Whitehead, but this guy, he's a mathematician who was trying to formalize the entire structure of, um, of like, analytic philosophy and mathematics. And in fact, uh, you know, girl incompleteness, for those of you who are programmers probably familiar with this, uh, was, was sort of a rejection of some of the stuff he was working on. But he's a very famous, like hardcore, like philosopher nerd kind of guy. And, and he, his articulation of what is this ultimate principle, believe it or not, it's creativity. Mm. For him, the ultimate abstract principle of actual existence is creativity. And we ourselves are expression of the aggregate creativity of the trillions of, uh, of atoms that comprise us and billions of cells and our societies and our cultures and our, and our groups and our families and our relationships are the expression of something and that thing you might as well call it. Um, but there is, there is free will in the sense of, again, the free will versus determinism paradox Right. Also is a is a faux paradox because it's rooted in static. I got static objects. I got causal laws for them. Where the hell is the determinism, right? You're just a pile of static objects. And if you turn on to process, it's like, well, no, the static object projection in the envelope is itself just a tool you use to help, you know, to, to help your, your predictive theories along. But there's plenty of places where those theories fall apart and you have to use like statistical mechanics. There's nothing deterministic about that at all. So, um, so if you can look through all of it, it's, it's creativity. And this ties to my first session about Robert Persig and metaphysical quality. Remember, static versus dynamic quality. Every level of patterns, you can see there is a dynamism, an energy in them. That's the, that's the thing that springs the thing forward, right? The ratchet picture, if I go back to the diagram here for those who were not here for that um, session, share. And it's this guy the the ratchet right and people's mindsets the conservative mindset the the the, the fixed mindset from, from Dweck's formulation that's the two and it's it provides friction from number one rotating but it also keeps them slipping back mm -hmm. that's you know what my life coach calls protection right you're trying to like protect yourself from hurt from pain from chaos and, and degeneration but something drives one what is the spring coiled up what is God's hand turning one forward? That is in everything. It's in every atom. It's in every beetle. It's in every human. It's in every state. It's in France. If you believe France exists, it's everywhere. There's a creative energy in France for sure, right? And so there is this, there is a, a universal cosmological principle. 
And I talked about this in that first uh, session as well, that the second law of thermodynamics is all about the action of two when that forward driving is, is done. When we have a closed system, if there ever is such a thing as a closed system, which there never is, but if we define a closed system, within the closed system, things will decay to energy, things will slip back, things will go backwards. And all the physics and equilibrium science is based on building theories and models and, and analytical equations for that. Very little of science and math is obsessed with what happens when there's energy, when there's new and excess of free energy coming in, what happens? And in all cases, new things happen, right? Things grow, things create new structures. Um, whether you're taking a cello bow on the side of a plate of metal with sand on it, whether you just put a bunch of random chemicals into a pot and put it under the sun for a few billion years, life happens and creativity blossoms across, the, across every level of the metaphysics. All right. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, Deef, you had a question. Um, I've been jumping different comments here and there, but uh, part of the way my, my mind works is to try to uh, integrate multiple perspectives and try to bring up the essence of your add-on of the creativity and artistic view, sort of this, uh, the essential, the artistic view to create, to capture the, the divine in the most concise and precise language or art art and then uh so one potential limitation is that by your medium of communication is very static pictures and words and mental models mm -hmm. isn't that a bit of a limitation to try to encourage somebody else to have a more time scale and waveform of perspective because uh, uh, Western models is just linear time, so you're automatically communicating by fractionating time from a cause and effect instead of a cyclical or nested layer of time. Right, or superposition, so, right? Yeah, so right. language and communication by this medium you're communicating mm -hmm. is reinforcing a materialist, atomized type of perspective. Yeah, well, I'm going to quote a very unlikely person to make an appearance here in the STOA, Donald Rumsfeld, the former Secretary of Defense for the United States, uh, famously quoted, I believe, you go to war with the metaphysics you have, not the metaphysics you wish you had, right? So, uh, or maybe that wasn't quite his quote, but that's essentially my variant on it. Um, to be completely honest, and I really appreciate everyone's engagement and questions here, um, I've been thinking about this stuff for a while. Some of these things are, go back 20 years when I was an undergrad, right, in, in, uh, in college. Some of these things are relatively new that I've discovered in the last few years as I've gotten deeper and deeper on memetics um, and, and the modern technological society. Um, but this is the first context where I've actually sat down and tried to elucidate, all, you know, paint a picture of many of these things for any kind of an audience that wasn't just like a couple of buddies over a beer. So, um, so you know, I think you're right. I think what would be great is if I could assemble when I talk about murmuration, right, it'll be a narrative over a video showing actually a flock of birds forming murmuration, right, that we could actually mm -hmm. have um, visual experiences that show this. And then when I talked about overlapping versus distinct, it's, it's um, yeah, a lot of it for me, uh, the model of communication um, is, is, is sort of like music is superpositional. Music and taste are the, you know, flavors and taste. Music and taste are the two things that we directly viscerally encounter every day that are intuitively superpositional. Everything else tends to be more Cartesian, more distinct, more, you know, um, uh, sequential and linearized and, and atomic. And so um, it would be great to have contrasts of those in a very accessible way to show people Imagine if we had to sequentialize music and it wasn't superpositional. Imagine, you know, like you could actually tell a story around this, not just imagine, but showing people and letting them hear the sounds. I think that'd be a very powerful way to get this kind of thing, to make this more accessible um, to a larger audience. I, I agree with you, Deef. This is definitely a limitation of the medium. And I, uh, but it's also kind of a, a, an audience that will bear with it, right? That will, that will tolerate the medium mm -hmm. and the limitations, so. But you're aware of, sounds like you're aware of the limitation of the medium. And you're yes, the best thing is we all get together in person and we walk through the woods and I point out things mm -hmm. that are illustrations of this principle to show these, these, to show the universality of some of these things, right? That would be the ideal thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good deal. Cool. Um, we are approaching the hour, so maybe it'd be prudent to wrap up. And I don't see any, uh, I see a lot of statements, but I don't see any uh, questions <laughs> uh, or I can't tease any out. 
Um, so Peter, do you, do you have any kind of closing thoughts or you want to set us up for next week? Um, well, I guess I would like to get a, a sense from people like uh, if this was, if this was, um, you know, useful or if like this was like, a, um, like, is it the right level of what people want to hear? Or is this um, a little too abstract? Or do you want like more, like what, I don't know what the, I don't know. Like, do people want me to just talk about memetics? I can talk about memetics and, and whatnot. Um, next time I could talk about, um, uh, oh shoot, the model of communications. I mean, maybe that's the right thing. I mean, it would be, maybe that's what I should talk about next time if folks are down with that. Yeah, um, people are saying this has been amazing. Just oh, okay. You. And okay. My, my, my preference when I, when I invite someone to the store is to talk about something that really resonates with them. And then there's, okay. like, a, there's like a bias filtering effect that people will gravitate towards that to, to the session. And I'm particularly really loving these sessions. I've been writing my journals about them. Oh, great. Um, and just, you know, that the idea of putting all these mental models and putting them beside each other just creates all these rich connections. And that alone, despite whatever meta memetic artifact gets produced from this, that alone is such a rich process. And you're so good at it. So, um, yeah, I'm very grateful. And I thank you. Well, grateful for you being here. Yeah, well, this is, this is just so much fun for me. I, I mean, it's a highlight of my week to get to just actually sit down and talk about some of these things that are near and dear to my heart and to my mind. Um, and so let's, let's tee up for next time. Let's really go and talk memetics and talk about the, starting with the model of communications, talk about the music boxes and the sculptures and um, go from there. Um, beautiful, right? beautiful. All right, Peter. Uh, Thank you so much. The, the fourth and final session of the Mental Model Series, same time uh, this week. We'll talk about memetics and communication. Um, for upcoming events, we have, a, we have a few today. We have a collective presencing, which is sort of a, a intersubjective practice that, you know, we get to practice this relationality and then have a felt sense of the contours of it. Um, and then it, that's at 12 p.m. Eastern time. And then at 3 p.m. Eastern time, uh, Nina Power is coming in to talk with Rachel Haywire and Raven Connolly and they're the Philosopher Queens series, which should be pretty cool. Uh, and we have a Socratic social tonight. Uh, if you just wanna you know, have random encounters and have deep talks, uh, that happens at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Maybe Gray is gonna be hosting this one. Um, that being said, feel free to check out all the events at the STOA. I'm just like trying to collect links here. And then you can support us on Patreon right there if uh, you'd like to support the essence of what we're doing here at the STOA. That being said, Peter, everyone, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great, uh, great weekend.